Sounds good. Well, we, I guess we'll have to get started. If not, we'll, okay. then we'll get done tonight. Right. So we'll take a few moments, first of all, make sure we're in fellowship with the Lord yeah. as part of making sure that we're uh, clean. Uh, I think uh, the scripture is real clear. If you look in the Old Testament, the priests couldn't do their job until they first of all had to wash. And they had to be no nicks on their face. I mean, he said, if you got a nick on your face, you can't serve. So it was kind of demonstrate how holy God is. He's, and he hasn't changed. He killed the man because he put his hand on the uh, ark Mark. that was going, and he to said, fall. it's falling over. So he, he put his hand up to help, yes, uh-huh. and he killed him. Because he told him not to do it. And because he had told him, he says, you know, you've got to treat me holy. My da- they David they was sad. You they know, he was they really weren't following instructions. Instructions. Yeah. The Levites, were, they were the only ones that could carry the, the ark. And in this case, they were moving the ark from one city to the other. And, and this guy yeah. saw that the, the looked like the cart was going to fall over, so he put his hand up. So good intentions don't don't save you. But it, I think David learned a lesson from that. Oh yeah. And that's why next time he says, okay, Levites, get in there, move this ark, mm-hmm. we'll do it this way, we're going to yeah. do sacrifices yeah. and everything. Poles. Yeah, exactly. So we... We get many lessons like that. You know, Moses, mm-hmm. take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. You know, Joshua told him the same thing. He says, you're standing on holy ground. Watch. Don't get that close to me. The idea is that God is holy and he hasn't changed. And so today, uh, I think what God has provided through the promise of 1 John 1, nine, he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means he forgive us the ones we mentioned, and then the unrighteous is all this other thing that I didn't know I did. So he'll clean it there. So we'll take a few moments of silence. So each one of you can do that. Prepare your hearts today, and then before we begin today's class. Father, we give you thanks for this time you've given us. To, we pray that your Holy Spirit be, be with us to make clear to us your truth so that we may be able to apply your uh, uh, your word in our lives in a way that brings you the most glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last time I, we went through those uh, seven great questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how, and how much. All those questions, whenever you're investigating anything, especially the word of God, you should make sure you have answers to those before you turn around and say, I understand what it's talking about. And, and as you listen to someone that, that teaches and everything, ask those questions. Say, well, yeah, but, you know, that doesn't connect up with the next verse. You know, it talks about this or that. So it, that's kind of what we're doing now. Hermeneutics is what they're supposed to do, what is called eisegesis, to, to take everything out of what the scripture is. But as listeners, then we should be able to hear and then verify. I mean, that's, uh, I think that's what the Bereans were doing. They were you know, checking to see if Paul, what Paul was saying is true. So now, I, we already went through those questions. We used 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. So if you have your Bibles, you can bring that out. And then we're going to use, we're going to analyze the words. And I don't mean we're going to go through a hot and Observe and... Observe and analyze the words, words or phrases that require research. Because there's words in, in the Bible that you say, well, what do, you know, it could mean these things. It, like, for example, the scripture is, it, it, uh, is inspired. Huh? Uh, poets are inspired. People are inspired. So what does that mean? So, and that's the kind of questions uh, you're going to look at the words and then say, well, these are ones that... It could be something different. So if you're looking at your notes, I'm going to be in this uh, number two. Uh, and then, you know, one of the bad things I didn't do was actually put pages on the All right. Well, we're going to be uh, using these uh, 12, 12 other words, of, uh, uh, other questions, Where in order to... 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures, God. Right. That's so here, scripture. we're going to see in uh, second. So if somebody would read that, go ahead. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. 
All scripture, all scripture is good, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's a child of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, so here are there words, number one, question number one, is, are there words or phrases that need explanation? Words with several meanings. For example, we talk about scripture. You know, we, we have, as Christians, we kind of say, well, yeah, when you say scripture, you're talking about the word of God. But scripture, why, why not preaching? Why not what God said? It's called scripture. So what, what is, there, is there a restriction to what we're supposed to understand as being inspired? No, because all that was, scripture. It says all scripture, and what does scripture mean? In other words, not just, we just say it's the Bible. What does the word itself uh, mean? And then we talk about to uh, be perfect, right? Uh, inspired, useful, so that a man, so that a man could maybe be perfect. So are we talking about no sin? You know, normally when we mean perfect, that's what we mean, right? We say somebody doesn't mess up. Is that what it's talking about here? So that's another question. What other word you might think uh, that needs some explanation? Righteousness. Righteousness. You know, we talk about self-righteous person. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> right? We talk about a righteous person. Does that mean that that person is always right? Well, what does it mean, right? So we'll start... And then man of God. Okay, we, 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 use, we know how it's used in the Old Testament. Man of God may be a, a prophet. Jesus Christ is a man of God, isn't he? And Paul is talking to, he says, so that the man of God might be, right, uh, might be perfect, equipped for every good work. And I'm saying, well, who is this man of God? Is that just men? <laughs> is it just one man or is one? Does he have to be a prophet? He has to be a pastor or is it just any... You know, and so we, what does it mean, man of God? So that those four phrases need a little bit, a little bit of uh, digging up, you know, before we say, oh, we understand what is being said there. Okay. And then are there theological words? You know, when we talk about inspiration and righteousness, those are two in that passage, right? Inspiration and righteousness are are something that's in the Bible. We don't talk about normally that somebody is righteous. We talk about only if it's in the Bible. We talk, we it, talk about it being self-righteous. <laughs> self-righteous or, you know, all of these things, right? Uh, but that's how. So, but these are persons-centered or God-centered. In this case, inspiration is God-inspired. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it has connected with God. And righteousness has to do with something that God evaluates, right? It's not just. You feel like it's, you know, I, you know. You, I remember in Detroit, you used to be, hey, hey, man, that's real righteous, man. Real, brother. <laughs> but what does that mean? So we have to look at that. And then are there things that are similar in this passage? And when we're looking at 2 Timothy 3.16, are they similar? So when we look at that, and then we're going to look at the structure of the task, which means we're going to be looking at the outline of what so what's there. So when we here's here's these that table that you have in your notes. And we're saying, are there things that are similar? You know, comparisons or illustrations or parallelism. So when it talks about uh, uh, and, and you'll notice that I'm some of the words that I'm using here are words I got from another translation. So your translation might have perfect, another one, adequate, so, you know, complete, complete, right, so, in this case, doctrine or teaching, what this is, is for teaching, for instruction, and reproof and correction, because we, we can see that's kind of parallel, you either, if you're reproof, that means you're telling people there's something wrong, and correcting, you're correcting, so they're, 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 what I'm going to say, uh, similar, in that sense. Uh, or teaching and instruction. Those are two things that we kind of associate with uh, teaching. We're going to instruct people. So why why is this scripture have two words that you know seem to be the same thing? Okay, uh, so that's what you're looking for. And then are there things that are different, contrasting ideas in this passage? Uh, uh, and uh, as I as I look at this passage. Uh, 
I don't see any contrast, nothing that says uh, one thing and something opposite. And so we're looking at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, just those two verses. And then uh, are, are there things that are repeated words in that in that in that passage, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Do you see anything repeated? Any words? Anybody? All in four. All in four. So those are the two that are repeated. Yeah. So we, we got those. And then uh, and then we have the next one. Are there things that imply cause and effect? Uh, purpose or result? And then this says, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it, basically, if you look at here, it says, <clears throat> all scripture is God breathed, and then all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is and is profitable. And then the word for doesn't that mean it's for a reason, right? It gives me a a reason. It says for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. All of those are are things we can say. Yeah, these this is talking about a cause and effect. And then and we have to understand that it's profitable. That inspiration is there, but it's for what purpose? So it can be profitable. So in that sense, and then we're equipped so we can do good works, right? That was if you look at that passage, that's that's what it's telling us. Okay, you see what I'm doing? It's it's these kind of questions that help us find. And, and right now, I'm dealing with just two verses. You know, when we go into like somebody asks the questions about tongues, well, these questions are the ones that are going to help us find out what it is. How is it used? Is it used properly? All of those things. Why? Why is Paul saying this? All that. We're going to be asking all those questions. And then now we can get a better idea. When somebody asks me about the gift of tongues, I've answered these questions. Why? Because that way when they, I'm asked, I can tell them, well, here's the reason. Why is the tongues given? It's so that, uh, so that uh, the Jews would be warned, as it says in Isaiah. Paul brings out that in, in Second Corinthians. So those are the kind of things that right now is kind of easy because we're just looking at two passages, two verses. Uh, and then uh, and then we have the idea, is there any indication of, of uh, and these are the ones that I'm just going to pass by because these are, is there any indication of progress, connection, logical, temporal, you know, like, like he moved, uh, Jesus moved from this, this town to the temple. He came the next day or something like that. So it's geographical. None of those things. Are there questions or answers? Now those I'm looking for just question marks. When you read the scripture, you see there's a question, then next to it will be an answer. Jesus is asked, you know, are you now going to bring the kingdom? And he says, and what is the sign of your coming? So those are two questions. Jesus in, in, uh, in Matthew, I think he only answers one of the questions. The other one he doesn't. The other, in Luke, I think he gives the answer to the first one. It says, when is it going to destroy the temple and all that? And that happens in the time of Rome, the Romans. So we're, we, we, we ask these things just to find out. If there's questions, I want to know what the answer is. And make sure I understand the answer from the scriptures. And uh, so... Are there connecting words? And then and, for, that. Can, can, can I yes. ask a question? <laughs> question about your question? Yeah. Is there always an answer after a question no. is given? No, 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 no not always. But normally you can look at the text to find if there is. Yes. When you're looking at the text, sometimes you'll see one verse and the question is there. But then the answer. Sometimes you have the answer, but not the question. Like in Corinthians, uh, it's but it's a bunch of these questions where Paul just says, let me tell you about marriage. And then he goes into an answer because there was a letter written to him and he's answering all those questions. Uh, let me tell you about spiritual gifts. Chapter 10, 11, 12. He'll, he'll, he's yeah, going through that whole question. three chapters answering a question. We don't know what the question is specifically, but he's giving them answers about it. I'm so. he could say, therefore... So you therefore, have to know to yeah, what yeah. What is there for yeah. exactly? So those are the those are the kind of questions. I mean, what we're doing in this passage, when we're looking at a certain passage, these are the questions we answer. 
And then, and then we have, um, uh, are there connecting words? And we said, yeah, and, right, where is it? And for, because it tells for training, for rights, you know, for the training and righteousness, for uh, reproof, for correction. So those are words that are there. That gives us connection. So it, and these are going to be important because we're going to see how you, you have to say, well, how does this two verses fit in all the things that Paul said up before and what he says after? And we're going to see that, that these, these, quest, these things are going to come in into helping us to determine if we've got the right answers. Are there things in order to follow and comply with? No, you know, like sometimes God says, uh, uh, you must, you know, do this, uh, uh, read this, teach this to your children and your children's children, and, you know, in order for it, for things to go well for you. So he gives us uh, orders to, to comply with. Be filled by the Spirit. That's a command. Right? If, yeah, so how do you do that? God, you know, you can't just tell me to do something. Is there something? And maybe it's not right there. You have to look at other parts of Scripture to find out the answer to that, to, to, to how I'm going to comply to that command. And then we have um, uh, figuratively. Sometimes you do find, you know, where it talks about, I saw a dragon coming from, from above. And is that really he saw a dragon literally but what does that tra dragon mean well later on a chapter later he says that dragon that you saw is the devil Satan the deceiver so you know some people have taken that dragon and say well it's talking about China China's <laughs> going to come in and do something <laughs> I said no if you look just search the scripture you can see that's not talking about China or other. Uh, and uh, so it's talking about the devil himself because he says right there the dragon is. Or the candlesticks that you saw are the seven churches. So you say, okay, so I know what those are. So, and that's where, uh, and then sometimes we have figurative sense, and that's okay. It says when they ask Jesus, you know, Herod, you know, you're not, Herod is looking for you or something like that. And he says, Herod is a fox. <laughs> and you say, well, did he mean that all of a sudden he became a four legged animal? He's walking around. No, it, it means that he has an attitude of being sneaky and things of that. That's what the fox. So there are times it talks about we, uh, and our interpretation of the scripture should be literal. If he says Jesus walked on water, I'm not looking for no, answers of how could he walk on water. Maybe he had some special shoes or maybe <laughs> from outer space. And <laughs> I'm saying he walked on water. He's God. He can do these things. So. And that's where sometimes, but sometimes it is figuratively, and we have to be able to get, because behind every figurative thing, there's a literal idea that he wants to talk I would, to I would use it as, as an example. I say that you know that God can't use his right hand because his son is sitting on it. <laughs> and there you go. Exactly. You take a literal. Yeah, exactly. His son is sitting on right. his right hand. And, and so, you know, sometimes people say, you're a literalist. Well, you know, how could this? And Jesus Christ says, I'm the door. So all of a sudden become hinges sometimes? <laughs> no, well, everybody we, we, knows what it means if you say I'm your right hand man. Yeah, everybody exactly. Everybody knows what that means. Exactly, exactly. So th those, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we'll have to get a figure and then be able to explain what that means uh, from the scripture and, and see if it fits the contents. Okay. Here we're going to see, uh, as I said, we're going to see these it's the scriptures, and we're going to say, here's the words that we kind of brought up and said, we need the, all scripture is God breathed or is inspired. So we, we have to look at that uh, scripture. Mm -hmm. We have uh, this other word here where it says uh, that a man may be adequate or perfect, if you see. What adequate, what does that mean? That means that he, yeah, he can do okay. That's how we mean when somebody says he's adequate. He says, well, he can... <laughs> do it, you know. Another, very, another translation is mature. Mature, exactly. So we have to we have to look at that word, and then we have to righteousness. You know, what does it mean about being righteous? You know, we have heard bad ideas about righteous. Is is this something that, that that God is a gift of God, or is it something that is earned? Because we we have to talk about righteousness uh, that it comes by faith. 
And that's when we believe in Jesus Christ. God gives us a gift of righteousness. He, he counts us right. We're justified and we're counts us righteousness. Right. But it also talks about Moses. Uh, it says the, the righteous man will live by faith. Okay. And, and so he, he does do work of some type. See, and that's where we have to say, we have to distinguish, is this uh, the gift of righteousness or is this righteousness where God says this is valuable work? Because God made us to do good works. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's evaluating. Righteousness is a evaluation of something. So that's what I'm saying. We have to go in, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the answers. What I meant to say is that these are the things we need to look at. Inspiration. What does, you know, we might have to look at the word itself. The, the, the Greek or the Hebrew in order to find that out. But you, don't, you won't have to do that. That's what people who, who investigate, you, know, you should be able to get a good commentary and they should be able to tell you, oh, what inspiration, what word is that? They all knew stuff in, in the Greek. Ken, I, I know Ken would say because he's told me before, but he said, um, that sometimes when you're looking at a scripture like that, you also have to look at, not particularly this scripture, but what's been said in other books of the Bible and what's said, you know. Yep. Perfect. You're right. Here, we're on step one. And we're always doing is looking at the scripture that we're looking at. The next step is interpretation, which is mean, what does it mean? And that, for that, Yes, you need context. Yeah, and that's where we go into looking at how is this word used elsewhere. Like this word of inspiration, uh, uh, right here, inspired. Actually, it's one word. And it's theonoustos, and never used anywhere else in the Bible. Mm. And, and basically, it's what they call a hapax legomena, meaning spoken once. That's it. So this is a word that we need to do a little bit more digging to figure out what it means. Because we, when we talk about inspired, we're saying, well, we feel something or, or something like that. But here, when it, when, and then literally it says, theonoustos, means God breathed. If I were to translate that literally, that's what it means. God spirited or God breathed. Because theo means, you know, God. And then noustas, it's used for spirit or wind or uh, and the like. So here it says it's God breathed. Uh, so anyway, so and then instruction, reproof, correction, all those words. We need to say, well, how come is 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 Paul stuttering, <laughs> saying the same idea or words, or is there some aspect of each of these that? that we need to make a distinction. Because remember, when scripture was written, it wasn't just, you know, eh, just make, just start writing. It's every word costs. <laughs> because if they had to copy every letter, every word, one by one. There was no copy machines like we do. So, and then, uh, so we'll be looking at what's the difference between reproof and correction? What's the difference between teaching and instruction? They're in, they're in there, so what's, there must be something that Paul is bringing up. So we'll be looking at that. Uh, note the structure. So we're talking about the main sentence. Yeah. Identify a main sentence uh, that we, we can, when, when we're here in this case, we're looking at the, the scripture of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And then uh, we're going to see the verbs and the, and the, and the, and the objects because Whenever we're, we're saying something, we're, uh, every every sentence has to have all the good parts in order to be able to be a logical thought being being taught to us. So we'll, we'll you know, uh, I'm gonna not spend a lot of time, but here, so we have to identify the main s sentence, um, the, uh, and then identify in this case, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And for instruction in righteousness. So that's the main sentence. Then the second sentence, it says, and then it says, so that. In other words, it, the reason God does wow. this, or all of this up here, is so, so that yeah. the man of God may be perfect or uh, adequate or complete or mature, equipped for every good work. So now we've, we've gotten it in two sentences. Mm -hmm. So it, it, and we say they're related. 
They're not, Paul isn't just saying, let me talk about uh, God's righteousness. Oh yeah, by the way, there's cookies. You have to use raisins and, and, and oatmeal when you want oatmeal cookies. You know, it, that wouldn't make no sense. So we see this is a letter, it's complete. It moves from one thing to the other. So that's what we're saying. We're gonna do that. We got the two, uh, the two questions and then we have to relate them to each other. The, the word that brings together those two sentences is so that. The so that kind of ties those two sentences together. Okay, so that makes sense? Right. So okay. that they will need the answer. Right, so, <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. now, Oh, okay, so now we get to the part you've been wanting to. <laughs> you want to jump right into the idea of interpretation. No, that's okay. I mean, I, I, we all, that, that, you know, one thing is to find out what this means, but then the, the real ultimate is to find how do I use what I just learned and I apply it today in my life. So that will be the last step. So don't, don't, add, don't jump too, too fast. We're going to go, this is going to take us a little longer. To go and that is to uh, take a look at uh, uh, the, the, we already said the main sentence and then the uh, and then what does it mean because that's what this this uh, part really is is for us we're going to be uh, the method of interpretation we're going to see how how to do this and i'm going to give you some rules in other words, instead of just saying well you know how do you feel what do you feel about this what do you think I remember being in a Bible study, and I can remember they said, you know, that we were talking about Hebrews chapter six, I think, where he says, "Here, the uh, it's, it says that it is impossible once again to bring into repentance those who have tasted uh, and, and uh, the, the gift." And I'm saying, okay, there's one guy would say, "Well, that you know, that's not talking about losing your salvation. You're saved. You're always saved." And the other guy would say, no, right here, that's what it means. It means that it's, you can, you can lose your salvation. Once you've messed up and you said no, then God <laughs> throws you away. It's, and, then, and then they turned over to me and says, what do you think, George? <laughs> say, what well, well, I think, though. I, mean, I, was, I was a new believer, and I can remember them asking that question. I said, what kind of Bible study is this? You know, you're coming to ask an idiot like me, I'm, that's what I'm here for. I want somebody to tell me the answer. So we have to have a good method of finding out what it means and not based on just opinions or what people, you know, like to think it says. What the majority think. Yeah, the majority, even the majority may be wrong. majority is always wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, it. that's kind of a rule of thumb. And then the important aspects of interpretation. We're going to take a look. What does it take to properly interpret? You know, we can't. You know, one of the things is you have to be a believer. If you're not a believer, forget about trying to figure out what the Word of God says. If you're not saved, you don't have the equipment. So that's like some of the things that we're going to talk about. And then we're going to say the rules of interpretation. Those are the ones we're going to cover a little bit more. Uh, so here, when we talk about the method uh, of interpretation, it says largely includes grammar, right? I mean, so you got to take a look at the words. Uh, any, any, if you want to know what a sentence means, or if you're translating from one uh, one uh, language to another, you got to know the, what this mean, this word means in that language, right? And uh, in order to properly uh, communicate what it says, so it, it, we have to use words and sentences that are clear. Mm -hmm. and then we have to look at it historically. Means uh, what was going on uh, at the time when Paul writes this? Why did he write it? You know what? You know when he refers to things that happened in the past. Well, okay, do we have something in the scripture? Sometimes we have to look at Acts and say, yeah, this is where he was talking about. He did this, and then. Uh, uh, and then when it talks about God created everything, well, where's that? Genesis chapter one, it talks about, tells us a bunch of details. So we're talking about historical and then theological. And I'm gonna say it this way. We all, study God. You know, as we get old, we all have to wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> right, because our vision is not there. So when we talk about Literally. perspective, perspective, we're talking about uh, properly being able to focus 
and that's what the theology is really like. When we talk about, you know, if we talk about God, well, you know, we have to have all of that in mind. If somebody said the Creator, well, who are we talking about? Well, the Creator is God. He, in the beginning, God created heavens, earth. So we have to have all of that behind us to kind of say, okay, I, I have a good idea. Same thing with the dispensations is one of the things that people kind of say, well, well what do you mean by dispensation? Well, God had in the past, we remember that God. That's what we was talking about, just. Oh, okay. that, so, see, I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> when I was in my car. <laughs> so, this is the idea that God communicated in different times, different things to different people, and how they were to maintain relationship with God. In the garden, there was only one commandment don't eat of that tree. Did he have to tell, the, you know, that was. And in that day, in that time, there was only one law. That's it. It was simple, right? Today, you know, in, in, during the Jerusalem, during the Jews' time, they, they had a bunch of rules. You have to, they, they you know, on Saturday, you can't do this. They couldn't even follow one of just one. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't do one, and, and, and he gives them more. But each of those are there to demonstrate how God has been patient, Yes. And he does provide, he provides judgment when you discipline, but also mercy. Because he could have just said, hey, you messed up, gone. <laughs> Turn the lake of fire. Trust me, we, you know, we're laughing and, you know, but what the Jews went through is for a lesson we had to learn. Yeah. It's a great lesson God yeah. was showing us. You know, showing his children, you know, when we look back and see it what says they all scriptures for yeah. learning. That's, yes, that's reason, and it's so amazing. You, it yeah. you know, what you know, they went through yeah. the lesson. And when God said, Do this, you know, even the temple, yeah. how they had to sacrifice. Yeah. The land oh, yeah. and the, that's the reason he spent the almost, reason, two, he spent almost 2,000 years writing yeah. down just for you. <laughs> just for me. Just Thank for you. Exactly. So, we're talking about. Uh, theological, uh, so we'll, we'll go to, let's see, uh, there you go, correct perspective, is, we said it's grammatical, we have to make sure that we're, if we're keeping rules of interpretation, uh, if, if it's figurative, then we have to figure out, okay, this is not supposed to be a little, Herod didn't turn legs when God, Jesus Christ says he, uh, he that he is uh, the fox, you know, they tell that fox, Herod, you mean? He was talking about his the attitude, so we understand that. Then we have to um, we have to have this uh, positive claim. It means what it says. In other words, when we talk about Jesus walked on the water, he walked on the water. That uh, the stream turned like uh, uh, dead man's blood in the Book of Revelation. Well, it didn't say it turned into dead man's blood. It said it like so it. Nice. That's how we have to make that distinction. It says mm -hmm. it's not. Other places he says, yeah, he turned into blood. Now they have to drink the blood. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we, we're talking about literal. It, it, when Moses went in and said, you know, Nile, water turned into blood. Boom. I, I got no problem doing that. I mean, I don't have one that I have to say, well, how scientific. And so people have. They've gone yeah. out and says, oh, yeah, what happened was a mountain over here was red mud. <laughs> and then it rained, you know, it, it broke down and then it get into the water and then it looked like man's blood. Yeah. No, the Bible didn't say it looked like blood. It said it turned blood. into blood. So therefore, I stopped there. And that, mm -hmm. that's what I mean. Uh, uh, we say that, um, and that means that it means. Precise. Means it's in its parts, it means it's totally, and it means that totally what it means in its parts. And its meaning forms, in other words, they're all one part. Now, we do understand that sometimes there's paradoxes, and uh, let me explain that one. That's in Luke chapter, um, uh, Luke, no, let's see, hold on, before I get there. Remember we were see, talking about Karen, how I yeah. needed to have him next to me at night when I'm reading. I'll just take him out of my purse. <laughs> <laughs> Here, uh, we, we talk about sometimes it's figurative. And we see that, uh, oh, come on. My hand is not working or my mouse ain't working that well. Okay, there it is. So it's literal when we talk about uh, blood. 
and then we see is figurative here in, uh, in Genesis 4, 9 to 11. Anybody have that? Anybody want to read that? This is a Bible study. We should have read some of the Bible. <laughs> And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And so, he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now are you cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand? So in that case, we're talking about a figurative. In other words, the idea that his brother's blood cries out from the land. It's not saying that, you know, Jesus, God is saying, hey, I'm hearing some voices. Oh, where's that at? Hey, there he is right there, that blood coming. No, it says, I see this. I know what's going on. You've killed your brother. <laughs> Therefore, it's telling me there has to be justice. There has to be uh, a righteous judgment done. And that's, figuratively, it says that the blood is crying out. What it means is that God understands that he needed to punish Cain for what he has done killed his own brother so that's that's what we see so uh, the, the, you know in this case the meaning is not hidden we don't see well there's a hidden meaning behind that no it, no, no, it's just it's the fine. idea is that God is using a paradox in other words he's saying a, a figurative way of saying that your 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 act of murder needs to be judged is that the same thing like saying when Adam and Eve picked that fruit and the Lord came and told them, you know, he told them before not to touch that. Right, not to eat. And they okay. have, yeah, and he tell them that, and asked them why did they, you know, he eat. said the one. But he had to punish the, the, Yes. you know, so that's the same. Well, in that case, something I think, no, I think it was a literal fruit. We don't know yeah. what it is. I, in other words, oh, when you look at that scripture, it, same, it doesn't have the what, idea that this, we have to take it figuratively. Yeah. We, we take it to be literal. If yeah. There was some fruit. It doesn't say it was an apple. Yeah. Some people say it's an apple. And I remember telling that to a, a professor of mine. He says, no, no, I don't think it was the apple that got us into trouble. It was the pear on the ground that, that did it. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> what I was saying is the consequence. The consequence. That's what I was looking at then. Yeah. So yes. he was to be, you know, yeah. that's, that's how that's a, that's what I mean. killed yes. his brother. Exactly. So th that's that's what we have to be looking at. We, get, you know, we understand that it could be figurative, uh, like in Genesis there, talking about the blood, but it's talking about negative. It is not hidden. We, we understand it isn't something that God just put uh, to, 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 for us to have to dig out and actually try to figure out is there a mystic meaning behind all of these things? No, many times we just say, I'll just take it as literal as it says, and that's it. By we stop faith. there. By faith. By faith. We, I mean, no, we, yeah, and that's what it says in <laughs> Hebrews. It says, by faith, yeah. we understand that the worlds came into existence by His Word. I, I'm not, I, I've never, I wasn't there, nobody else was there, but I, I believe 100% what the word says, and that's faith. Exactly. It's not mystic. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 21 to 23. Ephesians chapter what he said? Uh, chapter four. Verse twenty one. Twenty one to twenty three. Everybody eyes. In the middle of a sentence. If indeed you have. Uh, yeah, verse 21. If oh, when you heard about Christ, that word, oh. mind the long thing for yeah. you. 
it? If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct. You continue? Yeah, the yeah. old man which grows with with gro grows corrupt according to the the life here. Difficult the difficult lust and be re and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So here, you know, we say, well now you know, a lot a lot of people want to get religious and go out and do hmm, trying to get themselves in light. Here it's talking about you know putting the old self is is not it's in a, uh, what you call it? it it's not mystical it just says I gotta stop doing my old stuff old things that I used to do it, it, the the interpretation is there and then it explains it gives examples you know the, the lust means that the the sinful desires to do what's wrong okay so it tells us there so it says lay aside your old self. Put, stop being like you were before. It's clearly in the passage, but it's not. You don't have to sit up there and try to uh, do like meditation and <laughs> says now I can get rid of my all my sins and everything in that in that way. That's what I mean. So, uh, and then uh, we see uh, that there is some. Oops, no, let's take that back. I messed up. And when he said the old man, that means the sinful where you were before. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Your old self. The idea is now. It doesn't mean that it goes away, but we we yeah, can we, still you know, we can put it aside. In other words, the, the idea is it, sin will not take full. Now, we yeah, we have power, power yeah. ability to control our sin nature. Yeah. The old self is that that one before we used to as unbelievers we have no other choice but to sin because we're sinners. We're born sinners and. We didn't have the power to, to say no. Uh, and then, But as a believer, yeah, we do. God has given us capability to say no, to have control. But that comes through growth and, uh, and scripture. We don't start right off saying no. No, exactly. And he said, if you be tempted, don't say God tempted you. <laughs> to sin, yes, exactly. <laughs> James. So... Uh, and then we have uh, Galatians uh, uh, 4, 24. Now here we have a specific place where, yeah, there it, people like to allegorize everything in the scripture. Yeah. You know, in other words, they say, yeah, everything's just, you know, when talking about this, you know, walking down the... There's a whole, there's a whole denomination called out that interprets the Bible allegorically. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening to a Bible preacher the other day that was teaching against that. He said there are no allegories in the Bible. There is one, though. There is at least one. There's, there's this is one. This, this, is it. This, is it. this is it. This is it. This is it. Where it says the two women are... Yes. Um, yeah, yes. okay. So here... That's what I Paul, told you. I said there's at least one allegory, yep. but that's the only one I know of. And, and, and that's what Paul is doing. He says, you know, let me give you an illustration. That's what allegory does. It, it, does, it gives you an illustration. He, he told, he's going to tell us it ain't that they are actual mountains, and these women are not mountains. They're not. It's <laughs> something to help understand what he's already explained yeah. in the context. Comparing but, two women to two covenants. Two co yeah. exactly the old and the new. Exactly. So, and that's where uh, Galatians uh, four twenty four says this allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants, mm -hmm. one proceeding from. Mount Sinai, which is where Moses was given the law, right? Yeah. And then uh, bearing children who are to be slaves, and she she is Hagar. So yeah. here he's taking Hagar. one a picture of this is uh, slavery because Hagar was a slave, right? And that's where Abraham got his his, uh, his, his one of his kids, one of his kids, two, several of his kids. Yeah, exactly. So his mm -hmm. uh, and so we have to we understand thing. this as being allegorical because it specifically says it's allegorical. It's but in majority of every place else in the scripture, I think you could say yeah, there is no it's not allegorical. We mm -hmm. should interpret it literally, and only when you know the literal uh, doesn't make sense, 
uh, that we can be like hair to the fox. I'm not taking that literally. I, I understand to be what he's talking about. Herod is a is a is a cunning man and things of that type. So that's what we mean. So they are. This is one exception where we see uh, most most of all everything that we interpret should not be looking for everything is a picture. In other words, if you follow what I'm saying. Don't I'm treat the rest that. of the scripture like it's an allegory. There are types, but not, not right. Allegory. And that, exactly, there are types, and we will talk about that in a minute. I think. Oops. So we said that it's got to be uh, historical. We're looking at things as that they, they are happening. Uh, it means that uh, it means what it says. In other words, that's from the standpoint. If it says that uh, Jesus Christ is coming again, I believe that 100. percent I haven't mm -hmm. seen it, but he says he will come back again, yes. and therefore we believe it. So, how do you know if it's allegory? If it's allegory, well, in that case. The, in Galatians, Paul says this is an allegory. He's he specifically calls it. And he's talking about real talking, people anyway. Right, he's, right, talking, he's not, talking about real he's people, not, but he's, he's saying I'm he's using God. them as a picture. That's what allegory means. I'm putting mm -hmm. another story together with my the thought I'm trying to teach you. He's in, you know, like well, he didn't have PowerPoint, so <laughs> he has to use my words. So let me put a picture so you can understand what I'm saying. So from that standpoint. But most of everything else that I read in scripture, we don't look for that everything to be an allegory. Like that Jesus walked on water. That's an allegory. Jesus didn't really walk on water. It just means that he was above everybody and he <laughs> walked by. And allegory, you know, we, we, we try to explain it as not being a literal and we it's a story. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It just means that, you know, people wanted to see him more and therefore they came up with the, the story. I'm saying no, it's I'm not believer, a story. Unbelievers have, yeah. unbelievers do. They have to find a different explanation. Different explanation, exactly. So that's what we mean. So when I say read the scripture, if it makes sense literally, stop there. Don't bother trying to make it into like a story uh, outside of what, what is being taught. Uh, so we see that um, we see like in Matthew uh, let's see yeah. there's patterns we, we see patterns for example I'm sorry let's start look at uh, patterns in Matthew 2 14 and this is going to be important if somebody else gives me Hosea 11 1 uh, Matthew 2 14 or 15 somebody read that and somebody else go to Hosea 11 1 I've got Hosea okay Read Hosea first, because that, okay. that, that's historical. Hosea 11, 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Okay, so when my when Israel was a child, it means when it was a new young young nation. Remember, when did, when did they come out of Egypt? Were they a nation then? Not yet. They were just being born. God, in order to be a nation, what do you need? You need laws. You need territory, you need people, and somebody to be the boss, the king. So those are things you have to. And in order, yeah, exact kingdom needs a kingdom. So from that standpoint, we we're in that passage. Is he talk, who's he talking about? Well, no. Well, that, this is it. In that passage, oh, in the passage, it, in the passage talking Israel. it's talking about Israel. Israel. So. It, Israel is my child. Matthew, Matthew puts another meaning to it. Exactly. <laughs> so take a look at Ma uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother and by night and departed for Egypt and, and was there until the dead of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay, so both both verses have out of Egypt, I called my son. The first one is talking about when Israel comes out of slavery and he starts to uh, make a nation out. The second time is talking about Jesus when remember Herod is going to try to kill him, so they go into Egypt and they wait there until Herod dies, and then. 
they're brought back out of Egypt and brought back up into the promised land. Wait for God to tell him it's okay to go home. Exactly. (laughs) And God tells Joseph in a dream, it's time to go back home. So what I'm saying is that we see there's a pattern. See, God in his mind, he had in mind, it says, I'm going to, this event of Jesus having to go to Egypt to protect them, I'm already, I talked about it when I talked to about uh, Hosea when I talked about Israel coming out of Egypt. He is my son. So it's kind of, there's a pattern. We can see that there's uh, a God in his mind already knew what he was going to be doing. And this is just a way of saying, look, even uh, that prophet, even though he was talking about uh, Israel, he was written there so that when this thing happened here, when Jesus goes down to Egypt to be saved or to keep from being killed, that he would come out of Egypt it fulfilled that prophecy. When we say fulfilled, well, we have to be careful. And, and what I'm going to say it this way. Uh, it is now, but not yet. Fulfillment. Now, in other words, in the time of Hosea, it happened, it fulfilled. Satan, uh, uh, Israel did come out of Egypt. But it's not totally fulfilled until that prophecy isn't fulfilled until Jesus fulfills okay. the ultimate coming out of Egypt uh, to be to to be saved from Herod's de- uh, killing. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So we'll see some patterns like that. People talk about patterns like Joseph. What happened to Joseph? He was he, he, he was sold as a slave. They paid. His brothers sold him as a slave. Right? And we, we see Jesus was sold by Judas. By Judas, he betrayed him for uh, thirty pieces of silver. Right, so we see there's patterns that are repeated in the Bible, and sometimes that's how what Jesus Christ, when he talked about himself, he says, "Well, you know, it's just uh, Joseph was kind of a type or something like what was going to happen to me. He's unjustly treated by his own brothers. Is Judas one of his brothers? Yeah, he's a Jew. He's he's a fellow, you know, fellow Jew." And yet he's betrayed. Uh, there's other occasions that we'll see in the scripture, but we should be, uh, and that, that that'll be. Yeah. Uh, ten after eight. Yeah. Oh wow. He'd be outside. So, so here, what I'm trying to say is that yes, we can see patterns or types of uh, of, of that's explained. But we shouldn't be looking for, every, you know, like I think my professor one time says, you know, we're always explaining about all these little pictures and symbols. <laughs> we see that the tent, of the, the, uh, the tabernacle was built and everything. And he says, well, you know, I think, you know, of all of that stuff, I think some of those nails were just put there just to hold up <laughs> the temple. They weren't all, everything that you see in scripture isn't there just so they can come out with some picture or type out of it. And that's kind of like the idea. Yeah. It's like we something. believe they're there, but wait till the scripture itself tells you uh-huh. that it's there. It's in, like words, in this case, Matthew uh, Matthew says it, so therefore we know that's what it meant. But I, I, I you know, we should restrict ourselves to what the scripture does and not grab every little thing. You know, Jesus was on the boat. Oh, we have to think about something about boats and how that fits in our life and all that. No, it's a, he went into a boat, preached. What, what did he do for? So that people could hear him. That's why he went out to the sea, so people could hear what he had to say. So that's what we're talking about. It's, that, it's like before he said, it's like these preachers now. That's how they talk. Yeah. They yeah. take one little thing and then they point at somebody and then. Yeah. No. You know, it's. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. Strong. Exactly. And, and that's what we're so trying lost. to limit, limit yeah. that. Thank God. Okay, I know we, we yeah, went through all of this, and I think we need to, to stop here. Uh, next week, uh, we'll, we'll continue. Yeah.